on the screen. What does GTM stand for? Global Trademark. Oh wow, that's very creative. Very creative. Go to Mark and we clap for this gentleman. Please. Go to market. Why do we go to market to buy vegetables? No. Go to market to sell your products and services. So, we have seen how we will generate ideas. We have seen how we will validate our business idea. We have seen how we can think about our business model. And we have also got a product that is tested and ready to be taken to the market. Now, is this relevant from day one of your startup? I would say no. But do you have to start thinking about it right from the very beginning? The answer is yes. So when you launch the various activities we are going to discuss here, may depend on your startup, what stage it is in and at what rate it is scaling up. So keep that aspect in mind. I don't expect you to roll up your sleeves and start working on all of these from day one. But it's always good to know what all we will need to do in order to make our startup successful. So let's look at some of the elements. <coughs> Two concepts that I want you to remember and then we will talk about eight blocks on what is important for a person to really as an entrepreneur look at developing the business. We had the industry expert sharing and one of his final words was I consider myself to be an entrepreneur with technical capabilities. Do you remember the statement that he made? In order to become self-sustainable, in order to become impactful for the society and deal with that many numbers of farmers, it's very important for us to understand how we go to market. That's what we're going to cover in this session. But before that, there are two concepts out here on the board. One is called the market niche. What is the market niche that you are going to address? Of course, if you have, let's say, unit in Bagalkot, you may think Bagalkot is my market. But Bagalkot consists of so many age groups of people, right? For all the people who live in Bagalkot, your customers, a newborn baby, is it a customer? Just because it happens to be in Bagalkot? No. By the same token, there is no need for you to just define that Bagalkot is the market I am going to operate in. You may choose to do test marketing in Bagalkot. Because you are in Bagalkot, whichever location you are in, you may choose your local location to do test marketing but when you have to identify the market in which you operate, there are certain concepts we need to keep in mind, which we will see in the next slide. The next concept that we are going to look at is, what is the lifetime value of a customer? Let us assume that a customer buys a product from you for a certain amount, 100 rupees. Example, is the value of that customer 100 rupees? Or is it something more? We will discuss that. Yeah? First, let's look at market niche identification. These are the concepts that you need to know. What is the size of your market? Whom are you targeting? And how many potential customers are there in that market? For example, even if you say, my market is all India market, your product may be usable for a certain segment of the customers. Do you have some idea about the size of that segment? 
right? And do you think all the people in that segment will buy your product? Then all the competitors will have to shut shop and go home, right? That's not going to happen. You will have a certain percentage of the market segment that you are targeting. Yeah? And then again, there may be a targetable segment and a segment that you will achieve ultimately. To give you an example, suppose in the state of Karnataka, there are, how many farmers are there in Karnataka? Approximately? Approximate number. Whatever number you say, I'll accept. Go ahead. There is a 10 lakh number here. Any other numbers? Huh? 2 crore. 2 crore. 2 crore is better number. Okay, we'll go with 2 crore. Okay, we'll go with 2 crore. There, let's say there are 2 crore farmers in Karnataka and you decide that Karnataka is the initial market that you are going to for various reasons like logistics or the perishability of your product or whatever. You decide that Karnataka is the market that you want to address. And 2 crore farmers are there in Karnataka. Now, if you look at the concept of Tam Sam Song, Tam Sam Song, what is Tam? Tam is the total addressable market, in this case, 2 crores, right? There are 2 crores farmers in uh, Karnataka and any farmer in Karnataka can potentially use your product. Out of that, there is a Serviceable, obtainable market. Serviceable, obtainable market. What market can you obtain through your services and the resources that you have? There is also a serviceable, available market which is your scope to grow. So, for example, out of that 2 crore, let's assume that you've been able to build a market of, let's say, 1 lakh farmers initially. Within the first one year, you have been able to touch 1 lakh farmers and convert them into paying customers. You still have the gap between 1 lakh and 2 crore as your scope to grow. So, any product that you think of, your investors are going to ask you what is the market niche that you are going to operate in. And when you think of market niche, you can't just say all farmers, right? You need to be defined, you need to define your market niche and think in terms of Tam Sam Song, which will give you an idea of how exactly you can answer this question of what is your market niche. And your answer could well be that in the first one year, my market, target market niche is going to be this size. In five years, I'm going to grow it with this size. Because by then you have the numbers of times and so many of me. Make sense? Give me clap once. Good. Thank you. The next thing I want you to remember is the lifetime value of a customer. I am going to give you a very simple example here because right now we have to rush through this particular session. We have babies are waiting to do the next session. So, a lifetime value of the customer can look at as follows. Suppose a 25 year old customer buys your product for rupees 100 every month. Yeah, every month he needs 100 rupees worth of your product and he will need this product until he is 75 years old. For all 75 years or not, we don't know. But he will need this product till he is 75 years old. Example. That's the nature of your product. In that case, the lifetime value of this customer will be the average order value, which is rupees 100, multiplied by the number of orders that you can expect from him over his entire lifetime. So in this case, 100 rupees order order value into 12 months for the year into 50 years. That means from 25 to 75 years. 
So effectively, the lifetime value of that customer is actually 60,000 rupees. So you treat him with the respect of a 60,000 rupees customer, not as a 100 rupee customer. Yeah, so I took these small numbers basically to show you what the concept of lifetime value of a customer is. And you can think in terms of your product, the average cost, it may also go up. You may not sell after 10 years, you may not still sell it at 100 rupees, right? You will at least make it maybe 115 or 125, 150 rupees. But concept wise, this is the concept. And what is the lifetime value of that customer? But the same token, if a 50 year old man buys your product, then he's going to buy it only for 25 years more. So between these two customers, to which customer will you give more weightage? Though the average value is always 100 to the younger customer. Correct? So this helps us in terms of our thinking. Minimum resources available, where do we apply these resources to get the maximum return on your investment? Right? So if there are two customers, how do I differentiate between these two customers if I am able to serve only one of them? Right? These are things that will help you in terms of thinking through how do you do your targeting. Yeah. Moving on. We are going to talk about the primary eight blocks, building blocks for strategy. And in that we will look at branding, positioning, personal development and segmentation, which is the foundation, laying the basic foundation. Then we talk about your GTM strategy itself, which is mapping and tactics, analytics and measurement. And finally, we talk about the execution. How do you do? Involved marketing, outbound marketing, and how do you build your tech stack as you grow? Remember the Fanindra example of Red Bus? We will refer to that as well when it comes to technology stack. Let's first look at branding. What is a brand? What is a brand? Sorry? Sorry? Recognition, okay. Identity, yes. Value, yes, value. Brand is a promise of value. When you see Tata, you know that these people stand for this. So it's a promise of value to a customer or consumer. Right? So if you look at a logo is not a brand. It's not a brand. Google has a colorful you know, way of representing their name. By itself, it's not a brand. But what do you believe or what do you perceive when you see that word? Is the true brand? So it exists. Where does it exist? Does it exist in that word or in the mind of the consumer? Mind of the consumer. A tagline. Who has this tagline? Just do it. Nike. Good. Do you know why Nike says just do it? You know, mostly it is used for sports equipment, sports shoes and things like that, right? A lot of people who are interested in doing these sports like skiing or mountain climbing or, you know, skydiving, etc. They have the desire. But they say, oh, I have to go and buy these shorts, I have to go and buy these shoes, I have to buy this, go and buy this equipment, this gear, I don't know oh, what I'll give. Nike says, don't worry, we have everything. In our store, we have everything. You just go and do it. Yeah, so that's why they have this tagline called, just do it. You can clap. <laughs> A product feature, for example, Mercedes. My ex-boss invested in Mercedes always. Always used to drive only Mercedes, only because, not to show off. But he had an experience when he was driving from Chennai. He's from Denmark, incidentally. And uh, he was driving from uh, Pondicherry to Chennai. He was returning from Pondicherry to Chennai. And on the he, he had his wife and two kids in the car. And the driver was driving. Unfortunately, due to some problem, it went in head on crash and it's a tree. And the front of the car got completely crushed. But nobody in the car had any kind of a problem. The driver was safe. Uh, my boss, Peter Blanton, was safe. 
Jesus that now say to the children mercy. So he asked me this question that doesn't go away from my head. He says, can you put a value to the life of the family that you love so much? When mercy is being offered safety, why would I compare it with a hero hood I mean Kota City or a Maruti? which is not able to offer that promise to me. So the brand mercy to means means ultimate safety. And I'm willing to pay the premium price to get that particular feature. Right? So that is the feature of branding. Now, the company is invested in branding because it is the act of forming, forming a deep and long-term emotional connection with the consumer. And wrong. Loyalty and continuing revenues is the result of building a great brand. So, for example, in the agricultural products, we saw Mr. Venkatreddy saying yesterday that unprocessed onions attract a certain kind of a price. Same thing, graded and uh, branded and properly packaged attracts three times the price. What is the difference? The brand promises certain aspects like quality, gradation, is built into the brand name. When people see that, they see graded products, properly packed, properly picked and arriving at their destination in a good condition. That's why they see pay the premium price. And when we build the brand, we need to keep this in mind. A brand has got to have consistency in terms of the experience that it offers to its customers. It's not that today it is like this, one year later it will offer a different norm. A brand promise has got to be something that is maintained over time. Only then you have a strong brand. There is the related concept of positioning. How do you position your product? When there are so many other products, I also offer this, I also offer this, I also offer this, so many different products. How do you position your product? So the positioning framework is, you think in terms of who is it for? Who, did, who is the target audience for your product? I will give you an example also, which will make it clear. Who are currently dissatisfied with the product that is available in the market and therefore our product, the alternative that you are offering provides certain breakthrough capabilities, certain different capabilities unlike your competitors who do not offer that kind of a feature and therefore we deliver this value to the people who use my product. Here is an example. My wife is a left-handed Okay, how many left handed here? Oh, good, good, fun to you raise your left hand also. Yeah, great, so super. So, those of you who are left handed, I didn't see any lady raising their hand, otherwise, I directly ask the question to the lady. When you use a pair of scissors that is built for the right handed people, left handed people find it very difficult. It starts putting pressure in all kinds of places very difficult to use the scissors for a length of time because we designed for the right handed people yeah so if for example you identify that that is the segment because 8% of the people in the world are naturally born with left hand capabilities but because the fathers and mothers and their teacher keep on scolding them actually 3% end up as left handed during their life the rest forcibly change their hand to right hand. Have you seen that? Mother will say, don't eat with that hand. Don't write with that hand. <laughs> yeah, therefore you forcibly convert about 5% and 3% end up continuing to use left hand. But it's still a significant market. What is 3% of 8 billion people? Wow, that's quite a market size, right? So therefore supposing you decide that left handed people is your market segment, how do you position it? You say, this is for left-handed people who find it incon. Map it to what we had discussed earlier. You know, whatever is the framework on the left, how the example is panning out. This is for left-handed people who find it inconvenient to use regular scissors. We have developed a left-handers version that provides for long usage without discomfort, unlike ambidextrous scissors. 
some scissors manufacturers produce scissors they say left handed also can use right handed also can use but there are compromises that are made to suit a wide cross section of people but it's not as convenient as something designed specifically for the left hand unlike ambidextrous scissors that make some compromises to suit both right handed and left handed people we deliver custom built left handed scissors that are elegant and comfortable now you see how the positioning is done so nicely positioned right as to why would somebody who is left handed naturally consider buying this particular product so for your product you need to think through from a positioning framework perspective ask these questions for whom is your product what are they dissatisfied with currently what is your product replacing or substituting and what is the, what what is it that your product is offering what are the breakthrough capabilities or unique differentiators how is it unlike your current competition and what is the promise that you have to deliver to these people makes sense so in your presentations tomorrow see if you can think through some of this for your product that you are going to talk about on the stage and see if you can use this positioning framework to distinguish your product offering from all the other otherwise you will be operating in which ocean ah but you want to operate in blue ocean, blue ocean. brilliant can you give us a round of applause for that brilliant examples of great positioning couple of examples hot fresh pizza at your doorstep within 30 minutes or your money back whose positioning statement is this which product domino's ah, domino's of course domino's what is saying they are not saying that we'll give you masala vada naan noodle nothing they're saying just hot fresh pizza that's all we'll offer nothing else hot fresh the moment you eat this thing Same also. I'm sure most of you are oh, hot fresh pizza. Yeah, we will get right. And at your doorstep, you don't have to dress up, take out your vehicle, go look for a parking slot, all kinds of hassles removed at your doorstep. And within 30 minutes, that's all it will take. From the point of time you decide I want a pizza, you at your doorstep hot fresh pizza in 30 minutes. What happens if you don't deliver it? your money back yeah see how they have been able to make their positioning just with this one line hot fresh pizza at your doorstep within 30 minutes or your money back so can you develop a similar powerful positioning statement for your product offer that's a challenge that you should look at when somebody hears about it they should say hey where can i sign will you take card payment or shall i pay cash You know that's the kind of of motivation that they should get when they listen to your positioning statement. Let's like do one more. When it absolutely, positively has to be there overnight. Which product is this? Sorry, courier service. You are absolutely right. Do you know which courier service? FedEx. FedEx. when you know that it has to be there what is the it doesn't matter they say it doesn't matter you want a pin to be sent we'll send it you want an elephant to be sent we'll send it no problem whatever is the size whatever is the complexity but our brand promises when it positively absolutely has to be there where anywhere on the planet anywhere on the planet recently there was uh, you know Uh, problem over iceland they had this you know big built up built up of this clouds and all that and therefore they were not able to fly many of the airplanes dust clouds and many of the engines of aircrafts became bad they had to ground their aircraft many airlines had their aircraft grounded and for an airline company to really prosper the aircraft should be in the air right not on the ground they are on the ground they are not making money so they were losing millions every day and they needed cars to come in from various parts of the world to repair the engines and get it back on the air 
Do they ask, how much will you charge? Give me 5% discount. Yeah. Uh, will you at least try to get it to me in three days? No. For them, it's absolutely critical. I'm willing to spend that money if you promise that it will absolutely, positively be there overnight. Now, you see, this is an example of a positioning statement that makes it very compelling to consider that offering compared to anybody else's offering. So, for you, with the framework, think about how you can make your positioning statement so compelling that it provides good motivation for somebody to buy your product. Make sense? Clap once. Okay. So also, you need to look at the persona of your customer. You need to understand that what is the buying role. Is he an influencer? Is he the person who is going to pay for it? Is he the person who is going to actually use the product? Yeah, there may be several people who may be involved in the buying decision. For example, if you are selling to corporates, the purchase manager may be the person who will take that initial call. It may not be actual user. So you need to understand the persona of the customer and also the experiences that they will be looking for. What will a finance person be looking for? Whether it is the least cost. What will a production person be looking for? Is it of adequate quality? And so on. Okay? So you need to understand that. And what are some of the pain points that you are addressing through your product or solution? What are some of the pain points that you are addressing? What are some of the value goals of the end consumer who is going to use your product? Yeah? Understanding that. And what kind of information sources from which they are going to get information about your products and competing products? That's also important. Yeah? And demographics. A uh, person who is 45 plus will think differently from a person who is 37 years old. Right? So you need to be understanding what gender is he, what uh, background in terms of education background, is it from a primarily rural kind of a place or is it a semi-urban or urban and so on and so forth. Yeah, so you need to understand the persona of your customer. And then you do the segmentation. Segmentation can be either geographic, it can be demographic, that means age-wise, gender-wise, income-wise, or it can be psychographic, their lifestyle. Is this person somebody who really buys Mercedes, always eats in five-star hotels? Is it that kind of psycho psychographic profile? Or is it somebody who goes to Uruki hotels whenever he feels hungry? Yeah, so developing that psychographic profile of your target customer is also important. It helps you to develop your positioning statement. And what are the behavioral aspects? How do they use the product? What are the benefits they want? How loyal will they be? And so on. So each of these helps you to do the customer segmentation. I won't go too deep into this. It's actually a process to say any marketing is a process. It's not a one-off act, a child come and do marketing today, that's it. No, it's a thing that takes its own time and we need to have clearly identified steps through which we take the process. You can also build your content where you can write blog posts, it doesn't cost you anything, right? You can do some infographic, those of you who are good at graphics design can make infographics about what your product is and how it will benefit your consumer. You can create videos, two minute, three minute videos introducing like Sadhguru did, right? When you wanted to sell the concept of same your soil, you made a video, you sent it across, we watched it, and he immediately danced after that, yeah? So, you, you can make e-books, you can make white papers, reports, etc. Right? So, these are some of the ways in which you can spread your marketing content to the target segment. For each of these, you have a possibility of seeing whether it is a uh, effort, money, impact. How much effort, how much money to import, and how, what is the impact it will have. So, for each of these, for example, blog posts may be high in terms of effort because you have things to write. That's a way that people will read your blog, right? So, if there is a high level of effort, but medium in terms of the uh, money, and it can have a high impact. Like that. You can really, I mean, these are not prescriptive. You can figure out. I'm just giving you a model. Okay? So for each of the content you are developing, 
look at it in terms of how much effort it takes, how much money you will use, and what kind of impact it will have, and then choose which ones you will start with and how you will progress as you go. So we are interested also in knowing what is the return on our marketing investment. We make a certain investment, what kind of returns are we going to make? So that's the concept of return on marketing investment. Outbound inbound, outbound is what we are uh, you know, saying to the world, we are communicating it to the world. Whereas inbound is if we have a call center and people call and then we give information. Right? So both outbound and inbound are important from a marketing perspective. There are these concepts you also to write it on outbound and inbound and also write down about the end you will About the ATM we need. About the end you So please Google those because we don't have too much time we need to cover that I would have covered. But just note it down and Google those so that will be very useful. Finally, technology stack for marketing. So as you build your startup, as you get to a stage where you get some funding and you have access to OPM, what is OPM? Other people's money. Then you need to build your backend network. You need to invest in your servers, the connectivity, hire the right kind of people, open new offices and so on. So for each of those, we bought some level of money. So the technology stack could include your wanting to do analytics for your customer uh, and analyze why exactly they're buying your product. How do you leverage social media? We heard that a lot in the morning today. How do you manage your content, your content management system? How do you automate some of your work? I was talking to the expert, I was asking, do you respond? manually to every single thing that the farmer asks you. He says, no, I know in this season with potatoes there could be these problems. So the response is automated. If a farmer comes up with, let's say, a certain kind of problem, which I know will come in this time of the year on potatoes as a crop, then the response is automated. I don't have to intervene, right? So what level of marketing automation and how do you build a customer relationship management? Now, since we do not have too much time, I'm not going through these. And remember that planning is important. Though the plan itself may not be what you'll actually implement, important to have your plan ready because the plan itself is worthless, but the planning process makes you alert to make the changes while you are implementing. Yeah? After this, we have the business model canvas that our expert, David Samuel, sir, will explain to you in detail how you can create your business model canvas during a session on business model canvas. And again, components of a business plan. So those of you are interested, I can either request that uh, we send the, the copy of the slide to all the people. Yeah. So you will get a copy of the slide uh, on all your WhatsApp or whatever. So as you prepare your business plan, it will be easier for you to decide what all you should cover in your business plan. Right? We also have a session on business plan. I think that is for uh, in the afternoon today. We will have a session on business plan. We will cover that in a little more detail. Summary. Important. We discussed market niche. Tam Samsung. We discussed Lifetime value, not the value of the order, but what that potentially you can get over lifetime. And we discussed the eight elements. Brand, positioning, persona, segment, map, tactics, measure, and stack. Yeah? So, there is a final thing, as Steve Jobs says, and one more thing, right? He always ends this presentation, and one more thing. And one more thing here is growth hacking. This is something that is becoming very popular. Growth hacking is how do you use creativity, technology, and data in combination to make sure that you do rapid experimentation with coordinated action across multiple channels and experience faster growth? Yeah? So this is a one-line explanation of what is growth hacking. Again, I want you to write down this for growth hacking. And I am available for the next three, two days, two and a half days. Feel free to come and talk to me about what is growth hacking you are keen on this. It's one of the greatest ways in which you can really leverage technology, data and creativity to make sure that your startup grows much faster. 
Okay, thank you so much. I went at the speed of Rajdhani, I think, because I want David sir to cover the next topic. Very good afternoon. Uh, I seem to have eaten some bacteria also in my adventure outside. So my voice is sounding very funny. Uh, if you want cough and cold, come and meet me personally. Right. Uh, I don't know. I think I am coming down with the cough. But yeah. Hopefully it will go. So we are talking about market uh, research. We are talking about the techniques that are involved and the tools that we can use for market research. All right. So, because we don't have much time, I'm not getting into a detailed uh, introductory platform for this topic. We will quickly see uh, in our session today why it is required. Okay. So, this purchase for market research, and this is not just some hype, or this is not just yet another technology, or yet another. You know, entrepreneurial lingo, but it has some relevance for what we are doing in our startups. So, why do we require market research? Is the first area that we are going to cover. We will see what it means. We will also see uh, the survey methods that are there for market research, followed by uh, the three areas that we are going to do market research on. Right. So, the three areas would include your customers, would include your competitors, and obviously the market. That concludes the first part of our discussion. The second part is a snapshot of the tools that are easily and readily available for each one of us to use. We already know some of them. Probably the others we can navigate and you know we can get to uh, learn on our own. I'm not going to be very detailed in the presentation, uh, so please bear with me, uh, just for the lack of time. All right. So let's start. Um, why market research? Why do we need this? Anybody? Why should we? Why does an entrepreneur need to do market research? Anybody? To so find out the needs, okay? Pardon? Okay, to know the needs and desires of the customers. Very good. What else? Competition, to find out about the competition, what they are offering, what is the price point. Yes. Innovation, very good. So your innovation is derived from the market trends. Absolutely. So yes, I, I hope you are getting the questions uh, very clear. Whenever you are in any startup, and I'm sure you people have put your brains together yesterday, and you come up with some sort of an idea in terms of what you're going to present. Uh, if that be the reality that you really want to invest in time and effort and money, then these questions are definitely going to come your way. How would the customers react? 
right? Would this be a good fit? What is the product viability? What price should I sell? And the, you know, the, the question, the million dollar question, it's an existential question for all startups. Will people ultimately buy this product? Will people want to take this service? So the, the answer to all these questions and many more is guided in the next part. It is market research. Right? So if you are able to do market research, you get to know uh, the answer for will the product really work, are they interested, what price we can sell. All of that is going to just be a follow through if you are able to do your market research properly. Right? Now what is market research, anyone? I'm sure in your academics you have done your own research. I'm sure you have had uh, field experience as well as uh, horticulture students. Uh, my question is what do you understand as market research? What is this? What is market research? Anybody? Give me an unintelligent answer but do give me an answer. It doesn't matter. What is market research? Research of the market. That is what market research is. Yes, very good. Market research is researching the market. Right? Yeah. Now let us put some jargon and some masala in that definition and there it is. Gathering information about customers as well as the market to determine product or services viability. Okay? A little more concrete in terms of why we are doing this activity. So like Padma Kumar was just mentioning, marketing or whatever activity, these are all processes. They are not standalones. So even market research is a process. You have to undergo a lot of steps to look after the final, uh, you know. Uh, so what do we do in market research? What are the things that we have to do? Also, as many of you said at the start, there is a problem, there is a need, you need to identify this need, you, you need to identify the problem and then what do you do? You propose a solution, either through an innovative way or through your startup, whatever you are able to service in terms of technology or products that you are bringing. This is what your market survey is ultimately going to yield. So, if, if I were to give you the problem and the solution, alright, on a very quick uh, see through what is the problem and what is the solution. So here we have the problem. Problem could be customer related, all right. So the customer related problem, if you find that, if you are able to in your research find that yes, the customer has a problem, then the solution would be analyze the customer's needs. Can you give me some examples where startups have analyzed a need and then they've brought some technology or some products and then there's a startup there? Give me a quick example. Anybody? Pardon? Lens card. There you go. Lens card. For all of us with four eyes, we love lens card. I love lens card. This is actually from lens card. Right? Yeah. Because they have uh, everything that I dream in a store. Right? The first thing is I don't need to go to the store. I can do it online. And then they give one plus one offer. Brilliant. Can you think of some other, uh, you know, needs that were identified and then the startup came up with a bank? Google Pay. Google Pay, okay. <laughs> right. What else? Zomato. There we go. Uh, right. In your own field, in your own field, agriculture, horticulture, the, Isra the Israeli government, I saw some Indo-Israeli project running. So drip irrigation, if you can think of. Uh, why did they come up with this drip irrigation? Because they understood that there is a need. What is the need the customer has? He can't have water. Israel has an arid landscape. So they came up with drip irrigation from the need that they could identify. Right? I think some of the people who came and shared their experience, they are all innovators. These innovators have come up with farm equipment after they analyzed the need that the local community had. So all of that is coming through in this particular uh, thing. Then you have product related needs. You analyze the market, you get different products. All of what your examples are will fit over here. So if you are doing some market research, you will be able to identify product related things after you analyze the market. right? Then you have pricing needs. So pricing problems, let us say that you don't know what price to uh, peg yourself. You need to do some market research. What would you do? Regulate your pricing using different pricing strategies. 
So once again, friends, I'm, I know I'm just skipping the slides. I'm just going through point by point. Uh, but I hope if you have any doubts, please just flag me. Okay. Otherwise, I'll just complete uh, uh, the, the points that come up there. So what sort of pricing do we have? What sort of pricing do we have? What sort of pricings do we have? Especially for startups, what sort of pricings do we have? Any pricing strategies that we are aware of? Think of some pricing strategies. Pricing strategies. And I'm not talking about traditional pricing strategies, I'm talking about startups related. Right? So you have different options. Product and service is free. Right? The product and the service is free. Your pricing or your revenue in terms of what you earn is through ads. So the entire social media that we have is based on that same uh, pricing model. Where you are the product by the way. <laughs> Facebook has made us the product, right? We are the product. We think we are not, but yeah, we are the product. Because everything is free, right? So what we consume is money for them. So ads are what they are actually getting paid for. They are not getting uh, anything from the product or the service that they deliver. So that's one pricing model. Then there are pricing models where the product is free or product is less costly, but the service, the accessories cost more. Can you think of a product like that? Where the product is less in price, but the accessories or the service delivery is very costly. I won't say it's very costly, but it's, it's where they earn their money from. Xbox? Okay, I'm not an Xbox user. Uh, generational gap. <laughs> Maybe I was using Ybox. <laughs> I don't know Xbox. <laughs> anyway, uh, is the product less costly and then the accessories and all are very costly? Is that what's happening for the Xbox? Uh, the, that's one example. The very, very, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's found everywhere in every office. Printers. Printers cost very less. Isn't it? The cost of a printer is very less, but the cost of the ink is very costly. Right? That's why they make all the money. And I don't know how, but the ink finishes faster than you can uh, imagine. So every time you need to go for a refill, and that's how they make a lot of money. Okay. Swiggy also does this. Swiggy says, yeah, Swiggy says the product is free, the service is free. But if you become like, you know, if you get into subscription model, then delivery is free. Now for us, we really don't matter paying the 30 rupees or the 45 rupees or whatever, right? Depending on the geographical location. But imagine how much they are earning based on that. The service is free, but the pricing that they earn is because we say, okay, I'll pay an extra amount so that the delivery is free. But when they actually started these rascals, they promised free delivery. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> but now they are charging for that. I don't know if you followed this news, but somebody has put up on Twitter a comparative price point. What it costs you in the restaurant and what Swiggy is delivering at home. Right? It's highway robbery, by the way. Yeah. But we got so used to Swiggy now, uh, you can't think of going beyond. Premiums? Premiums? Have you heard of this term? Premiums, where the basic you know, the product or the service is free, but the premiums will cost. Can you think of some products that follow this? So there you go. Okay. LinkedIn. All right. So many app-based services that follow this. Okay. Uh, even YouTube. YouTube premium ad-free. I don't know if you know this life hack. If you add a dash between YouTube, it becomes ad -free. <laughs> so go to the URL and put a dash. Why go you dash you? <laughs> you people seem to be more excited about this than agree. <laughs> you are all like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I follow some some people on Insta, and these people have no other business but to uh, crack code. <laughs> yeah, so they, they keep posting these stuffs. Anyway, so then you have uh, value-based pricing, value-based pricing for products that the customer may 
ascribe great value, you can charge a premium. Or products which are critical, like for example, cancer drugs. Okay, drugs that are life savers, they cost you a lot more. The drug may not necessarily cost them that much to manufacture, but then, you know, there's always a fee to pay. And then you have this decoy effect. Have you heard about the decoy effect? Decoy effect, we are all victims to the decoy effect. So if you've ever gone to a multiplex and if you see the popcorn that they sell, yeah, mm, next time don't fall for it. <laughs> yeah, so they have the small, right? So I'm just giving an arbitrary example. The small may cost you 30 rupees. The medium will cost you 90 rupees. The large will cost you 100 rupees. So anybody who is going to buy will think medium ka ko kharidna Right? 10 rupee ka ko farak hai But in the ploy what they did was They took your eyes off the 30 rupees bargain if Nobody goes for the 30 rupees bargain right? So it's like a decoy effect And Apple has used it number of times So when Apple uh, 11 I think was being launched The uh, the base was I think 699 dollars Then the Apple Pro was uh, $999 and the Apple Pro Max was $1099. Everybody like a mad rush went and brought you know, $999, 1099 is not much of difference. Yeah. But nobody watched it in the basic model. By the way, the features are the same. <laughs> yeah, all you do is make calls. <laughs> and that's about it. But then the decoy effect. So all these are pricing strategies that you can use. Distribution, okay. Like Ninja Cart comes to an comes to a mind where they have used uh, oh sorry I didn't uh, yeah so if you place related right so how do you uh, if that's your problem so you focus on the distribution channels and the management therefore then we have promotion related how do you promote because I hope you understand not all the products sell in all the locations right. So you, you need to decipher the behavior of the customer based on the geo location. For example, in Tamil Nadu, anybody from Tamil Nadu here? Tamil Nadu? Very difficult to get thumbs up. I don't know why. I am a thumbs up man. But if I am in Tamil Nadu, I have to literally hunt from shop to shop to get thumbs up. It's not that thumbs up is not sold over there. But people prefer Pepsi. So you will get Pepsi everywhere, but you will hardly find thumbs up in stores. So you see what's happening, the preference of the customer in that location is very different. Okay, You will see this all the time, you will see this even in uh, Andhra Telangana. For example, Andhra people, they if they don't see curd on the table, they will throw a hissy fit. Right? But Telangana people are least bother about curd. Right? Whether there is curd, there is no curd, it doesn't matter. Right? Yeah. Half the time people don't even touch the curd. So again, you have preferences between uh, same tele Telugu speaking groups. So how do you do that? You you decipher behavior based on the region and then you promote. Competition, the last one, right? Your problem would be competition. So how do you do market research and find out you shadow the competition? So if you remember, Zomato was a company that existed before Swiggy came in. Zomato was a company which was into rating restaurants and listing them. That was their prime business when they started. Then Swiggy comes and Zomato watches Swiggy and sees what fun they are having in delivering and then these people join the market. Right? And of course now after the IPO things have changed but you understand with that example what I am trying to write. Right? So please be aware of the realities that have happened with startups. There is a problem. The market research helps us to get the solution. So these are the problems at the top and the bottom uh, gives the uh, in the, below the icon, that's the solution that you get. All right. So here we have market survey methods. I don't think this needs any explanation because I'm sure we have all participated as students in one or multiple options that there are. Right. So you could use tools to conduct some survey, any sort of a tool, whether it's a telephonic uh, tool or you send an email blast or some chat when you are trying to gather information, that's available. You could do this in one-to-one -one persons. You could do this in a focus group. Focus group is you, you attract people who have 
uh, you know, who tend to represent the segment that you are trying to address and then you ask them questions, you find out their uh, requirements, their needs, you conduct an interview, you ask them review for their product, you ask them these are features, do you think this feature works, this feature doesn't, what impacts you, what impact, what other things you expect from the same product. So focus groups will give you, and there are so many forums that you can, you know, get focus groups from online as well. Then you have email surveys where I'm sure we are getting a lot of email surveys for different products. Uh, we are also getting email surveys for um, food outlets, right? So you go to a particular food and then you get an email saying thank you for visiting us. If you drop your visiting card in the, in the bowl, they'll send you asking for survey. All of these things are market surveys that get uh, data from us. Questionnaires of all sorts, right? Yesterday, by the way, we sent you a Google form. Uh, in sort of a questionnaire for your uh, for you to fill up so that you can uh, better have a grip uh, on how you are generating ideas and then you have group discussions where you bring people and then you discuss the viability of this product you discuss what is going right what is going wrong whether they have preference for competitive products etc just to gather data so all of these are uh, methods that you can use there are many methods I'm just highlighting a couple of them what does designing market strategy look like? Designing market strategy, what does this look like? So, the first step is to define your objectives. The first step is to collect information, right? The second one is to collect sample, as in get your sample ready and then prepare a questionnaire for the survey. So what sort of samples are we aware of for collecting data? What sort of samples are we aware of? Different types of samples? Random sample for field research. I'm sure you have done your. Uh, I'm sure you have done your own, uh, you know, survey to get and what samples you've used. Anybody? What sort of samples are there? I should close the class in five minutes. Otherwise, some people will die of hunger. <laughs> The Hunger Games have started. Huh? What sort of samples are happening? When you want to collect data, what sort of samples are available? Give me some examples of samples. Random sample is one. What else? How do you get samples? You just can't depend on random, right? What else is there? A little louder. Huh? They don't talk like James Bond, but this is not top secret. Right? Be a little louder. Yes? Yes, the lady at the back. Okay. Standardized samples, stratified samples, cluster samples. Okay, you understand? All these are different samples that you, as in, you can get these people uh, or these representatives uh, in terms of finding out. Uh, data from and asking questions to them. Solutions will come after you get the data and you analyze. Then you can come with a solution and the last step is to document your observations for future reference. What are you going to focus your market survey on? Now there are a lot of components. I'm not really getting into all of the details. However, three very important areas that you need to do your market survey for. The first one is you are going to do market survey for the customer. So what to know, how to know and from whom to know. Three categories. So for the customer, it's very important. Uh, the principal, you know, a person of interest is the customer. So we need to know. And these are the things that we need to know about the customer. Who is the customer? What age group? What gender? What economic status? What are the buying behaviors? What are the preference in, in terms of choice? Uh, where do they purchase these type of commodities if there is a commodity available, right? Or a typical uh, similar service? What type of facilities customers get from their local vendors? All of this happening at uh, the what to know. How to know? You can conduct interviews, you can discussions, you can take field trips, a lot of uh, you know options available. From whom can you get this? From local shopkeepers, from sellers, from customers and from producers. 
So I am giving you what is very easy. These are low hanging fruits. You can address them and you can you know get your data running. Then you can do a lot of other uh, complicated methods uh, to understand your customers. You can deep dive. But at face value, this should help you to divide the market and understand who you are going to service, who this particular product or service is going to be relevant for, who is going to be the beneficiary behind the idea that you have generated, right? And please note, uh, not all people are going to be our customers. So yes, even if you are operating in the Indian market, you need to have a specific group that you will target and that's your primary area of doing business for. It's not everybody. So for example, morning, uh, uh, the keynote speaker who came and shared his experience. Now, who are his customers? Farmers are his customers. Right? Not everybody is a farmer. You understand? Also, when some people were asking him, he was very categorical in saying, I have no experience in grapes. So are grape farmers his customers? No. Right? I, I, part of what he spoke, I think, I understand part of it, what is in Canada. Uh, so pomegranates, I think he's dealing with. Right? I could gather that from the discussion. Uh, so there are, again, you know, it, it's, it, you have to be very sure about who your customers are. You also need to know, apart from customers, what is your market? So it's very easy to convince ourselves that, hey look, there's a lot of market, there's a lot of business, there's a lot of potential here. Uh, yeah, don't get too happy because it may not necessarily be factual. So don't disconnect from reality. Don't live in Alice in Blunderland, okay? Yeah, so again, what to know about the market, how to know and whom to know. Okay? So here are all the things. What is your market area, the geography? Where are you going to operate? Are you going to operate pan India? Are you going to operate in your local area? Are you going to start there? Statewide, a couple of states, right? So depending on how big your market coverage is, a lot of other things will automatically expand. So your capital investment will expand your channel, marketing channels will expand. All of this will necessarily get impacted the moment you start, uh, uh, you know, identifying the geographical location. So in your market research, you need to do this all the time. All right. Um, in addition to this, what are you going to get in terms of how to know what is your market? You can do that. Yeah. Once again, discussions, questionnaire, data calculations from different sources will help you understand what your market is. Also, please note what sort of a product that you are delivering, what sort of a service you are doing. Is it offline? Is it online? Right? So, I have had a lot of people who have wanted to get into online uh, you know, based activity, startups, online based activities and they, they think, they feel uh, that the Indian market, quote unquote, is their market. But if you actually know, it's not reality. So, for example, if you are running an app-based uh, uh, startup, right? If your startup, the idea that you have is an app-based one, it's strictly online. So, guess what your market size is? And I'm talking about the full country. What is your market size? How much do you take a wild guess? How many people? How many people, if it's an online, uh, you know, tool or app or whatever it is, and there's a payment also is involved in that, payment, uh, they have to use payment gateways and all. What is the market size? And I'm talking about numbers. Take a wild guess. Sorry? <laughs> okay, I wish it was. <laughs> right? It's just three crores. That's all. Three crore people is, is what we are fighting for. So all the Zomatos, all the Swiggies, all the Creds, all these people are fighting for these three crore people. So to speak, even the mutual funds, the all these people, the fight is only for these three crores. And the, the equation is very simple. 140 crores, the population, out of 140 crores, 40 crore people have mobile internet. So this is not what I am telling, this is data that is available. Only 40 crores out of 140 crores, have mobile internet. Out of this 40 crores, 
only 10 crores actively use UPI transactions. Out of this 10 crores, 3 crores have been, I mean, they've done some uh, fact finding. Only about 3 crores have disposable income. These people actually want to buy mutual funds. They have uh, life insurance, they have accidental insurance, and all of that, which means they have money to spend for these. You know, and this is your market that you are going to address. So be very, very careful, be very optimistic, at the same time, be realistic. Don't, don't just be uh, led to believe otherwise. Okay? Yeah, if it is offline, if it is offline, if it is not online, I just give you an online example. If it is offline, then yes, you have uh, a lot of you know, inputs that you can uh, use such as this to factor in. Right? Now this 3 crores which I am talking about, online example which I gave is whole India. So if you only want to target your local area, then you may end up with maybe 5 lakh people. That's all. That's your market. Right? Where are you going to get this? Who am I going to get this information from? Local shopkeepers, authorities, associations. Right? So there are syndicates that you can go to and they will give you this information. Ready to use information. And then you have competitors. Once again, what to know about competitors? All of this. How to know about them? Coming up there. And then the last part from whom to know. So competitors, we need to know these competitors, right? The art of war says, keep your enemies close, uh, sorry, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. So you may, now I am not saying all competition are enemies, but then in business, that's what it means, right? So you need to know who they are, you need to where they are, what goods they are producing, what is the competitive edge that they bring, right? Is it like a monopoly, okay? Is, is there some IP, IPR, right? Intellectual property rights. Is, is there some uh, loophole in what they are? Or is, is there something that they have forgotten to address? Like for example, cab aggregators came, the market got flooded with four wheelers. Then somebody said, I'd like to start something uh, on two wheels. And it became an instant hit in cities. So you have these Rapido and you have these Bing and all, I don't know. Yeah, so Goa is full of those yellow bikes. Uh, you know, if you go to Goa, I'm sure you have gone to Goa. Yeah, not too far away from here, right? Yeah. I think it's just a four or five hours drive. Uh, all right. So please know your competitors. Once you know your competitors, you can uh, you can get into doing wonders for yourself in terms of the market survey and in terms of the market research that you are associated. All right. So this is Peter Drucker, and uh, this is what he has said. Uh, why do we do this survey? So that once you know your customers, once you know how it fits, the product or the service will sell itself. You don't need to really go and stand on your head. You don't need to, uh, you know, unnecessarily strain your efforts. Uh, if you do proper market research, if you do proper market survey, if you understand all the uh, different components that we will be discussing, it becomes a real brief for you to run through with your uh, things. What are the tools available? Okay. Realize, utilize, maximize, what are the tools available? And I'm going to close with these 10 tools that are coming up on the screen. Okay. Now, we understand this first one very well. We are in love with this Google form. But uh, there is more life outside Google Form also, right? Now, many of these things are paid platforms. Hence, we don't necessarily go and subscribe uh, to use them. But all of them, literally all of them, have a free version and then a paid version. The free versions are equally as good or even better with their analytics. The Google Forms. I've used Google Forms extensively. The analytics are a shade paler when you compare, let us say this last one, ask your target market. The analytics are very strong. So you might probably want to spend some time, see these apps and decide which one works better uh, to collect data. Right? So these are all tools. They're all free, available, but there's some features that you have to pay for. But if you're really interested in, in uh, you know, starting and investing your time and effort, then find as well pay up for these, use one of these tools that will help you for uh, getting market information, market intelligence, which is very, very important. All right. Uh, that finishes my address. I uh, think I have, uh, uh, thank you so very much.
I hope you can associate whatever we are discussing here and connect the dots. They may look like standalones, but all of what we are uh, detailing, what Padmit Kaur said, what I'm just completed and in the afternoon session we have another uh, topic that we're going to touch base. All of these are interconnected. Okay? Is there anything that we have left with? Any other announcements? ये वीडियो रे ऑफ मार दो 